Here with us today, we have Jules Pieri from The Gromit, uh, Nick Jones from Libby Glass, and Derek Lowe from Low and Sons. So I want to set the scene for our conversation. The e-commerce market overall has seen a major growth in 2020, really driven by consumers' lack of access to traditional retail shopping, especially during the COVID-related pandemic and shelter-in-place orders. Um, but however, not all the verticals within the market have observed equal success, which, which you can see here on the slide, where it really demonstrates the disparity between a lot of the industry verticals. All right, so we're going to start off with Jules, co-founder and CEO of The Gromit. She'll be discussing how The Gromit, an online marketplace featuring creators and small businesses, is supporting their sellers during this unique time. Jules. So the Gromit, we launch um, products from uh, innovative products from small businesses. And um, we've worked with a lot of companies that nobody knew when we started with them, but our household names. So um, brands you know would be Fitbit, Bombas, Swell Water Bottles, Otterbox, SodaStream. Maybe you'd know Simply Safe or Bananagrams, products that um, in many people's lives have become um, beloved. And they all start out small, uh, innovative products all start out with a very, very small team and a, and a, a founder's vision. And during COVID, um, now imagine we're working with those uh, future Bombas and future Swells right now um, are particularly vulnerable. And um, one reason they became really vulnerable was that many of them sell some or of their products on Amazon as well. And as we all know, Amazon stopped receiving their products and stopped shipping their products. Yet um, those products, when I looked at the, um, the graph we just looked at, our categories are four of the top six. So they, they were essential to many people, even if they weren't shampoo or hand sanitizer, because they were translating their homes into everything else, offices, daycares, gyms. And so that required a lot of retrofitting and our products tend to be very practical problem solvers that people really, really did need. Um, and we never stopped um, delivering and we never stopped receiving. Ingram Micro is an important partner there. We have um, two different 3PLs through um, with Shipwire and Ingram Micro. And the first thing I did was myself in my seat was verify their um, employment practices. Essentially, I, I was pretty confident of what might be happening in our distribution centers, but I was asking questions I would have never asked before. And that was really important to me was in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. It's called the J Group. And it's a family-owned business, and that's how they acted. I was very reassured with what they put in place very, very quickly. The other thing we did was um, with Shipwire, we spun up just in case a third 3PL in, in uh, Tennessee because we didn't know. Remember the early days, we had no idea if we would be shut down any at any minute. And Ingram Micro did um, get us a classification in California. As a um, so I was reassured by that, very reassured um, to have that in place as well. And I guess the, um, the next thing we're doing or the thing we're ongoing doing is staying in close touch. We have um, launched um, product This is about half of those are live on our site um, right now. And um, that's a huge number of suppliers. It's more than Walmart has. And uh, we don't have the same number of products, obviously. Walmart works with very large suppliers with a very large span of products from any one supplier. But it's a lot of communication that's required and supply chains definitely are interrupted. So we're staying very tight with each of our, we call them makers, we don't call them suppliers, but each of our makers. I'm going to pivot this over to Nick. Nick Jones is Libby's customer experience manager um, for Libby Glassware. Um, so as a historically B2B glassware company that more recently expanded into the B2C commerce, e-commerce, um, Libby's markets include food service and B2B retail. Nick will be talking a little bit about how they're continuing to move forward and make business progress despite all the changes that we're dealing with. All right. Well, thank you very much. So my name is Nick Jones. Yeah, I've, I've been with Libby for almost 10 years now. And, you know, I've been lucky to kind of see the, the business transform over that time. 
we're definitely uh, an organization in a lot of transformation today. So there's always, you know, we're always evolving, but uh, we're definitely moving forward. Um, we, you know, we've been around for 200 years. Uh, if you're not familiar with Libby, you know, if you've, you know, been to a bar or restaurant in the past, however many years, the chances are you've used some of our products. We're the largest tabletop uh, manufacturer in North America. So, uh, you know, food service, the restaurant industry is definitely our core business. Um, so as you could expect, you know, with the this COVID situation, you know, our, our core business has taken a serious toll because, you know, people really can't dine in to restaurants. So um, that's really, you know, we're, I've been in a very lucky spot due to the e-commerce business that we're in and a part of. So, you know, we started our e-commerce business four years ago. And I'll, I'm going to give a little backstory just to kind of set the stage for really, you know, how we've really been successful, especially the beginning of 2020 and kind of what we're doing to, to continue moving forward. Um, you know, as, as a large uh, global company like us, who's been around for over 200 years, you know, we have a lot of, you know, um, you know, big, you know, process requirements and things like that. And when you're starting an e-commerce business, you know, that, that can be scary because it's brand new. We've never done it before. Um, you know, and we start really started early on was building large business cases and, you know, making these big decisions to, you know, of what we're going to do. This is how we're going to look. This is what we're going to do online. These are the partners and vendors that we're going to work with and kind of deciding all of this stuff before we even really got started. And um, so we kind of have a drastic transformation from even four years ago when we started our e-commerce business to today where we've really started to take the approach of, you know, maybe, maybe instead of doing these big, expensive, drastic, that could be even risky things to, to our business, we're doing a lot more of testing and learning. So just really small scale tests, even if it's things where we hear something online, oh, this sounds good, maybe we could try this or that, um, really, you know, saying, okay, well, let's, let's try it then. It's, you know, it's low investment or none at all. We, we like the whole, you know, no uh, financial investment if we can, but, um, you know, focusing on trying something new, testing it and whether it's a success or maybe sometimes it's a failure, but at least we know it's a low risk. We didn't invest a lot, but the beauty of that is, is that, you know, if we continue that and keep doing that, continue testing, continue learning, applying what we learn, whether it's good or bad, you know, and retesting or, you know, moving to a new channel for, you know, selling online or taking, using some new tools that help us, you know, leverage our capabilities with our partners that we already have, maybe. We've really just gotten good at small testing and learning, trialing things. Um, you know, and, and setting small goals to see in where we can compare and see how we, we ultimately uh, come out on that. But the beauty of that is, is we've been doing that now for a few years and more and more, uh, you know, as we evolve, we're doing it more often. Um, you know, when when the COVID situation came up earlier this year, um, we were we were in a really good spot because it didn't really phase our team whatsoever. I mean, we, we kind of, we kind of, where we're used to testing new things out and being exposed to new challenging things all the time. And we kind of took it as um, kind of standard processing for us. Um, obviously there was different things that we had to do and, and, and adapt to, but um, we, were, we were kind of ready for it. And you know, I know that's easier said than done, but it was a process that, that we had to go through over the, a few years to really get us to a point where we were like, okay, yeah, this is just another thing that you know we have to deal with, and you know um, it's not going to be the last. That you know that's I think that's the other thing I wanted to, to talk about is you know how we've evolved and learned about testing and learning over the time is you know it's you know it's it's the expectation of building a large business case, requesting funding, getting approval, and then saying this is how the result's going to be. Those days are kind of slowly you know moving on, and it's it's rarer and rarer to, to get the result you expect before you even get started with something. So kind of getting started quickly, learning from it and adapting and evolving that has, we found a lot of success with that. Um, and I also want to say, I mean, I would, I would say, you know, from partnering with Ingram from a, from a e-commerce and dropship fulfillment platform, um, you know, I, I really would never have wanted or would ever want to partner with anyone else during some a situation like this. I mean, I, I have to give it to Ingram's uh, fulfillment operations. They're, they're world class. They really, 
you know, we, we operate in four of their locations and, um, you know, we didn't lose a beat and we, you know, it was significantly over forecast, which is, which is a great thing. You know, sales are great, but if you can't fulfill the orders, that doesn't really mean anything for the end user and customer experience. So um, they were really able to, to keep us going um, from a fulfillment standpoint. And so I just wanted to, you know, call that out too, that it's, it's a great partnership and, um, you know, we're, we're really happy. Our final panelist is Derek. He's the co-founder and the chief marketing officer for Low & Sons. Um, Derek's going to tell us a little bit about Low & Sons, a digitally native high-end travel bag company that has shifted their advertising and business tactics during this time. So, Derek, if you could please. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Derek Lowe. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with our company, we're a family owned, uh, private, you know, small business, uh, based out of Brooklyn, New York city, now technically based out of multiple <laughs> places, uh, cause everybody's working remotely. Um, but I started the company in 2010 with, uh, my mom, my older brother, uh, and myself, uh, my mom was really the catalyst, um, being she, at the time she was 65 and retired and was traveling a lot, uh, for, for personal reasons and had a lot of back, neck and shoulder issues and uh, was complaining a lot about how there weren't really great lightweight, but practical yet stylish travel bags. Um, and so in complaining to my brother and myself, my brother actually suggested uh, that she create one herself. And at the time he was working in, in China doing design research, but also DJing professionally and uh, so she said, sure, why, why don't you help me make it? And then he's like, oh crap, I gotta help her make it now. <laughs> um, and then I, at the time I was working in advertising and had been working on a variety of you know small and large brands like Dove, soaps and shampoos, vitamin water, um, you know, Sony and a variety of different, and Converse and a variety of different clients. And so she asked if I wanted to help join the business, I think, you know, more out of like courtesy, uh, just cause I'm the youngest and it was like the last to be <laughs> asked. And, uh, I actually quit my job pretty immediately and said, I'm ready to join. And she was like, Oh, you quit your job. <laughs> she didn't expect me to quit my job. Um, and yeah, that was basically the beginning of it all. And we, um, you know, for the past 10 years have uh, steadily grown our business. Uh, and, you know, have actually partnered with Shipwire ever since the beginning. And so we're, we're really happy to continue that uh, partnership with, with Shipwire. And um, yeah, and so we now have, uh, we, we still sell pretty much 99% of our products through our own website. Um, and as you guys saw in the chart, I don't know if, is there any way you can go that shows the different categories and the growth or not growth? But as you guys can see, the last category on it is bags and travel accessories. <laughs> so we have um, been obviously really negatively impacted by the coronavirus. Um, luckily, because of our supply chain um, being primarily in Asia, we we sort of knew even in the end of December that you know this was going to come down the pipeline, and so we started preparing for it. You know, in the beginning of 2020. Um, the, you know, we, we definitely saw, um, you know, signs that it was, it, it could be potentially really bad. <laughs> um, so we were lucky in some sense to have a global supply chain and, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're somewhat mentally prepared. We, we had no idea what was going to happen, but, you know, I think mentally and, you know, spiritually we're, we're definitely ready for a big tidal wave. Um, so it's, it's been definitely really challenging for the past couple of months. Um, when it did hit, uh, the U S and New York in particular, uh, it was really challenging because we were not only having to figure out what to do as a business and how to adjust our marketing and our advertising, uh, and sales strategy, but it was like physically the team was having to figure out how do we actually execute work. So I'm, I'm sure everybody has gone through this, but. Um, the fact that we're e-commerce really saved the day because, you know, luckily we'd have to deal with shutting down stores and, and physical brick and mortar, uh, distribution channels. Um, but you know, when, when it first happened, I think 
the the main things that we had to really do was sort of see where the floor was for us. So we actually, you know, for the first, I would say, week of kind of the shutdown in New York City and, and essentially most of the top cities in the country, we basically just sort of were just trying to see what that worst case scenario was. And when we saw that it was really bad, we were like, okay, we got to do something about this. And our immediate response was, well, we're going to have to run some promotions. And um, and then we didn't just run like a, a normal promotion. It was like 40% off everything plus another 15% off with the code support small business. So so basically what we were, we were really faced with was what do we say, you know? And so um, it was in some ways like a, an act of desperation in a lot of ways. We were just like, guys, this is not great for us. And we, you know, my mom, my brother and I wrote a really heartfelt email uh, and note to all of our, you know, email subscribers and social media followers. We explained to everybody what the situation was, how we were negatively impacted. Um, and we just asked people to support not only us, but all small businesses. And I think just sort of that, you know, that genuine, authentic message really resonated with people. And we had a very successful um sale pretty much all the way through the end of April. Um, and, you know, during that time period, we also uh, were just also seeing front and center in New York City, all the devastation and the deaths. And so one of my brother's good friends is an EMT and works uh, in the healthcare profession. And, you know, he just offered to send him a bag. And um, because, you know, he, he was saying how he was having to carry all of his equipment you know, and, and wanting to keep dirty stuff, you know, separate from the clean stuff. And we actually have a, a, a collection of products called the Catalina collection that have a bottom pocket where you can separate like shoes and dirty clothes from like the clean stuff. And so when he received it, um, he was like, oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And actually his colleagues were all asking about the products and, and we, we were surprised to find that people were actually finding our products really helpful during this time in the medical profession. And so we we started actually reaching out to specific hospitals in the New York City area because it's, you know, there was just so many that were, you know, dealing with so much. And people were really receptive in finding the products really helpful for the day-to-day -day commute. And some people obviously, you know, couldn't even be around their families or having to stay in different, you know, homes and travel and go back and forth between all, all of these places. And so we ended up over the course of, I would say a month, um, donating over $500,000 worth of products, uh, roughly about 300 or 3000 plus bags. And for a, a brand like ours, which is, you know, still a small family business and independently owned, you know, that, that for us was like a huge, huge deal, um, to, you know, to be donating so much during a time where even for us, we were financially struggling and still, you know, facing a loss of a lot of adversity. So um, what we found though, was that by doing that in some ways it had great marketing value. And so we, we also, you know, created a whole web page on our website that's dedicated to explaining how much we donated and all the work that we've done. Um, and that, that actually has circulated quite widely in the healthcare community. So I, I guess now we have a lot of really great fans and, and loyal customers in the healthcare community, which is great. Um, so those were kind of like two initial things that we, we, we dealt with. Um, but even before that, I, I kind of forgot what, what we ended up doing is like a lot of our products were marketed for air travel and obviously nobody's, you know, traveling by air right now. So we ended up starting to prepare and update some of our photography and positioning of the products from air travel to car, uh, train, and just like, you know, everyday commute. Um, so those are probably the two to three main things that we um, have done to kind of pivot and adjust to the situation. But, you know, the reality is that we sell products for people to leave their homes and not many people are leaving their homes right now. So it's, um, it's been a lot of just leaning on the promotions um, and continuing to try and, um, you know, just get people to convert. So the first question is for Jules. Uh, 
from the grommet for the grommet. Uh, do you see brands coming to you to get access to a network that would otherwise not be available to them? And which product categories have you seen the largest increase in sales? Um, also, are there any products that have had a spike in sales that surprised you? Yes, definitely. Um, I think the um, interruptions, the service interruptions from Amazon definitely gave some small businesses a pause and, and businesses were put out of business if they were entirely dependent on Amazon and couldn't survive two months without shipping. So um, they sort of realized a message we've been saying for a really long time. It's kind of business 101 to, to distribute or, you know, to have a variety of distribution, not just one customer. And so, yes, the def we, we see two to 300 products a week in that, uh, and we launch five or five to seven. And that number has, you know, continued steadily to, to grow even during this time frame where people are looking for alternative distribution. And our main job, our, what we do is um, help give credibility and amplification for products that would otherwise maybe never see the light of day. And they're brilliant and they're worthy. So it's nothing to do with the quality of the product or the company or its values. It's just super hard to break through in a crowded world. So that's our job. And generally um, you can't do that on, on the big platforms because you, you have to basically pay to play and, and people aren't searching for something they've never heard of. They're not searching for solving a problem they didn't realize they could solve. So um, definitely um, an influx of products. And some of them are obvious, like masks, you know, where we have to be super careful that the masks are actually doing what they say they're going to do. So we need to see the testing because we, we test and vet, vet everything. We don't just put something up on our site. And um, we have a less than 3% return rate, which um, if you operate in e-commerce, you know, is extremely low. It's generally a double digit you know, teens to twenties. And that's because the products are, are, are worthy. The products that um, are selling now that would have never normally sold right now are toys. Um, you know, it's not like March to April is not, May is not a big toy season. Um, so educational to time, you know, to kind of using up time to just using up physical energy toys and, children's but also adults you know puzzles and things like that um and also art kits like you know parents are turning into daycare centers and, and teachers so looking for anything that's you know using time productively the other thing um sort of similar to that would be um, diy food so cheese making kits bread making kits sober dough is a um, bread making kit that you make with um, beer and frankly it just was never in the top 100 products ever and now it's top 10, you know, so wow. it's doing really well. And um, so those those aren't super surprising. Anything that turns a home into a better office, makes your yard more enjoyable, lets you work out at home. Like we've sold some very expensive pieces of home workout equipment that wouldn't typically be that popular. But I'd say two products that surprised me is our, um, there's something called North Country invented by a former Maine lobsterman. And these large, um, heavy, handmade wood, um, boy bells, they're called, um, that have evoke a certain sound from a certain body of water. Like if you love Martha's Vineyard or you love um, a particular body of water, these, these, these bells do that. And um, they're super, you know, it's just selling like crazy. And I think it's a, people can't leave home, so they like to hear the sounds of water somewhere they love, but also they're enjoying their homes more. And a very similar product is made out of Harbor Springs, Michigan, by a father-daughter team and a, and a bunch of people called Lake Art. And it's a, um, it's not auditory, it's visual, but it's a piece of art. Again, we, we don't do a lot of art, so this surprises me. It's um, a laser-caught, layered um, piece that represents a body of water that you love. You can pick any lake, any sound on the ocean and it's many layers made out of wood handmade again in harbor springs michigan and so i think people are again derek i'm sorry that they're not able to actually travel but they're traveling through the things they're bringing to their homes um, sorry, I, I, oh, sorry. I actually have a question. No, no, like, are you finding that yeah. you know obviously there's going to be certain categories that may be increased during this time period you know 
how many of those categories do you think are sustainable beyond it? Or do you think it's sort of going to see its peak and then dip off a little bit and then be supplanted by what was, you know, being sold before? Um, I don't think the toy one will, will remain for obvious reasons. Um, and even somewhat the DIY side of it, I don't think will remain when people get busier and, and don't have the time to do these things. I do think anything that relates to sort of productivity and effectiveness will remain. So the gym equipment, the home office equipment um, will definitely I yeah. think continue, continue to grow. Some of the health and safety stuff, like we do a really nice job with health and safety generally. And I, I think there are new categories there. I mean, you guys have probably seen on Instagram, one of our makers created um, a, a little key where you can open up doors and you can push elevator buttons that, you know, it's kind of a wallet or pocket-based tool that, you know, won't go away. That, it's like that and new solutions in that area. I'm going to actually pivot this to Nick next. Um, can you talk a little bit about the tests that you were, that you guys did at Libby um, and to see, you know, what exactly did you do to essentially determine which channels were successful through those tests? Yeah. Um, so first thing I'll mention is kind of something that Jules said early on was really about, you know, kind of diversifying your distribution model or channels, you know, having different, uh, places to to either sell product or get them to because you know yeah Amazon though it may be a big play a big platform you know it's there's lots of other places that that you can connect to and and be very successful so um, I think when you when you diversify like just like investing I mean the more you areas you play it and and you're in your you're you're there on um, I think ultimately it, it it improves your chances of success. Libby, we are traditionally a B2B company, uh, you know, from our food service business, it's all B2B. We, we do not sell directly to end users at this time, but, um, you know, we, we know that many customers and users, whether for their home or for a bar or restaurant owner, you know, they're looking to get access to our products in a, a less, um, a more frictionless way. So whether that's buying direct or online or, you know, through a direct, some sort of channel. So we're, you know, we're looking at that always. But for our e-commerce business, you know, especially in the past few months, um, some things that we did was, uh, grow. so I manage our customer service team as well. So we handle all of our orders, making sure all the product information is is on the on different platforms and, and partner sites properly. Um, we, we enabled online chat. So that was something that, you know, we really had no experience on, but, um, you know, we work with some customer service tools and things like that. And we, we wanted to try it. We've been wanting to try it. We thought maybe this is a good time we're all working from home, um, you know, we're just gonna turn it on and see what happens. And, and we did, and um, within, you know, a few weeks, we were getting a, a good amount of chats coming in. And, you know, it was interesting because we were we were solving questions and solving problems for customers that we probably would never get if they didn't have that way of communication. Like they don't want, they don't really wanna call on the phone. They don't wanna necessarily type out or compose a new email. So that, you know, that quick, you know, if you're on our website, there's a little button that pops up. Hey, if you need to have a question, just reply and we'll, you know, get to someone. And, and we did that and it was really neat. Um, you know, it's still just a small portion of what we do, but um, it, it definitely, I think, connects to people that we may not ever come in contact with. Uh, so I think that's really important is just having, you know, you can, you can call us, you can text us, you can um, chat with us. You know, there's so many different ways you can send a message, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. You know, so um, we're trying to become accessible. You know, as a brand, we have a lot of product experience. You know, we've, we've got a lot of experience about, you know, glassware and whatever, you know, for your home. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can, you know, people can connect with us and we can be able to help out, you know, those, those, those questions. Another thing was, you know, expanding to new direct-to-consumer channels. So, again, we're relatively new to the whole direct-to-consumer world. And, um, but we do see there's a lot of um, excitement there and there's a lot of opportunity there. So, you know, we don't want to disrupt or, um, you know, negatively impact our, you know, distribution or big, large retail partners that we, you know, we spent long, we have, you know, really strong relationships with, but, um, you know, we do see an opportunity there in, in B2C. And, and so like one of the channels was Walmart Marketplace. You know, we've, we've never even considered it. And we're like, hey, you know, we have everything in place Shipwire, you know, plugs right into it. 
So let's try it. And it was, yeah. you know, we spent maybe a few hours talking about it and we turned up and turned on a couple items and, you know, it's, you know, it's, we, we're doing it low risk. So we're not, we don't want to, you know, upset our other relationships with, with Walmart, for example, but um, it's, it's, it's a nice, it's an extra little business that we, we didn't have before. And, um, you know, we see a lot of opportunity there. So it's just, it's a, just an example of, you know, looking at different channels. I mean, there's so many out there now, um, you know, Etsy is, is doing really well and there's other opportunities for, you know, custom design glassware and, and things like that. So um, we're kind of looking at, you know, all angles, but those are a few uh, examples that we, we recently, you know, started. This next question is about uh, just the overall shopping experience, the online shopping experience. Can you um, share some steps you have taken to improve your online shopping experience to help with sales conversion? I'm actually going to pivot this question over to Derek first. If you want to just share your take on it, and then I'll give some time to yeah. Joe and Nick. Um, yeah. Hmm. I think for us, probably the main thing that we focus in, focused in on was just the promotions, just the deals. Um, you know, we, we use Shopify as a platform, which is a great platform, but one of the, uh, constraints and I think, you know, maybe downsides of using something like Shopify is there's less flexibility with like the cart and, you know, the checkout experience. So even simple things like how you display a price. So we had, um, you know, 40% off and then another 15% off that those sale prices with the coupon code and on Shopify, you can't, um, you can't apply coupon codes in the cart. You have to apply it in the checkout. And so we had yeah. to do some basic things like updating how the sale prices are displayed on our collection pages and our product pages, just to kind of make it more understandable what, what you would pay after you apply the, the coupon code as well. So those, that was probably the, the simplest, but like most impactful thing that we did. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I think for us, we, we just continue to, you know, highlight the promotions because that's basically all we could yeah. really do. Have all three of you had any particular useful advice, tips, actions from other entrepreneurs or CEOs in a very similar situations um, that have guided their response to this situation with the COVID pandemic and how to navigate? I wouldn't say uh, I got this advice, but I'm going to give this advice. Okay. <laughs> Not just love me to claim my own advice, but I will. Um, awesome. I am at, we have a 75 person team and, and everybody's at home, right? Literally everybody. And um, I took it upon myself to have a daily communication with everybody in the company about what's going on. And they, they call it a lifeline. Even though we have, you know, vibrant Slack channels, vibrant every, every possible um, mode of communication, but there's still this sense of like, but do I really know what's going on? You know, do I really know? And we have a long history of transparency, but you know, that's a big commitment to every day come up with something that's worth everybody's time, but it's well worth it. Thanks. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. Like, I think the daily communication has has been really, really important. Um, one thing I've also realized is that, you know, there's different people who expect or want different levels of certainty. And so obviously we're in a time where like, nobody has any clue what's gonna happen six months from now. But as a business, you have to forecast, you know, even with supply chain, it's like you have to forecast six yeah. to nine months in advance. And so, um, you know, I think that's, that's probably been the biggest learning lesson is how to deal with knowing that there's so much uncertainty, but providing as much planning and certainty as you can as a leader and as a manager. And, you know, that's really difficult because nobody really knows for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Nick, do you have on um, any tips or advice or stuff that you guys have shared across your team on how to navigate through this? Yeah. I mean, it's, it kind of echoes what, what uh, Jules and Derek said. I mean, we we don't yeah. really know how it's going to go, but we have to keep pushing forward and putting effort into it. It's definitely harder, I think, sometimes, you know, especially when everybody's home to stay motivated sometimes because you're kind of like, okay, I'm home. I'm not used to this. I don't know exactly what I should be doing. Um, so, you know, definitely keeping in communication. You know, we, we do um, Skype or Teams calls, you know, all the time and, you know, uh, Friday Zoom happy hours in the afternoon helps sometimes too, just to kind of 
kind of loosen it up a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, really it's staying in communication. I think that's, that's the biggest factor, but I would also, you know, back to what I originally was talking about with just, you know, becoming comfortable with the uncomfortableness of, you know, changing, you know, economy or business or, you know, world things that come on. I mean, the more you practice um, trying different things and, and, and it, it becomes, it becomes easier. I mean, it's, it's definitely still hard, but it's, um, it becomes natural to to kind of take things as they come and just work through them and yeah. problem solve. I'm going to squeeze in one more question, um, and it's going to be about supply chain challenges. So we know that there's disruptions sometimes that happen at any time. Um, what are you guys doing today to take those steps to kind of communicate that to your customers, work with the team? Um, how are, How is that happening for you? And I'll start with um, Jules. We're probably a little bit different in that um, we're the um, secondhand party here. We're not controlling the supply chains, but we need really good information. And it's been interesting. Customers have been tolerant. Like our NPS scores went up in April to over 80. We're always in the 70s, which is really high anyway, but they went up over 80. And I think people just had such low... I'm guessing, I don't know why they went up for sure, but I assume they were just so happy that people were shipping and people had products to sell. Um, but it's gotten harder, definitely. So we've enabled um, more aggressive back ordering and, and the communication is key there. And, and our systems aren't great for that. So there's a lot of manual work for us to do that well, but um, that's, the best thing we can do. And then obvi obviously, um, the more that something's domestically produced, the less risk we have collectively. And our makers have always aspired to, to manufacture in the US and they've worked hard to do so. And they often cannot because the technologies or materials are not available here. Um, but they will keep pushing hard or harder and that we're 12 years old as a company and that did not matter to customers when we started as much as it does now. It's a big topic and matters a lot to our makers. Derek, do you want to go next on that yeah, one? Yeah, I mean, luckily, thanks to you guys, we haven't had a lot of delivery <laughs> issues. So we haven't had a lot of disruptions on that front, but certainly on the manufacturing supply chain side, it's it's been very disrupted. Um, you know, we, we had a factory in Cambodia that basically shut down for two months and just they said, you know what, like we're we're gonna sit this one out for a couple months. Um, yeah, you know that's that was a little nerve wracking because they're one of our primary uh, manufacturers. Um, but we had already basically started um, even prior to COVID having essentially backup plans. So having you know one primary factory and then a backup factory. So we kind of you know we're somewhat prepared for it. But you know I think the biggest issue now is just going to be the volume production volume so like a lot of the factories want to get fed and they need volume and so now because the demand side is not there you know we can't place larger orders and grow with them so there's definitely even on the manufacturing side going to be a shakeout in in terms of the number of factories that remain open and can continue to survive um so yeah it's it's definitely been really tough but i think we you know, my mom has always been the proponent of like, you hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. And so even though it's been a lot of work like up, up until COVID to have multiple factories for the same products and having backups, you know, this is the kind of situation where that kind of has come in very, very helpful. <laughs> and then Nick, I will hand it off to you for the last okay. answer. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, we, we had a, our plan kind of going into the year and early in the year for kind of how our outlook would be for the next six, six to nine months or so. And, you know, once, um, you know, middle of March, you know, our factories shut down. I mean, we, we do have us manufacturing, which we're, we're lucky there, but, um, it was shut down. And so that plan that we had that was supposed to get us through the next so many months was completely thrown out the window. Um, we were also, I guess, you know, for the products that we make are, you know, they cater really well towards you entertaining at home, you know, just, you know, people are home, they want maybe some fresh glassware set or, or whatever that may be. And um, so we, we, we saw a really big spike in, in volume and um, you know, we were, we were, we were, we got really close. We, you know, once we ran out of the inventory, so we replenished from our, 
own fact our own factories and warehouses to the Ingram facilities. And as we were, you know, really starting to run out of stuff, um, you know, we were we had some some residual inventory that we were able to, to to transfer over, but we were getting very close. And I mean, we definitely run out of quite a bit of items, and um, so we it was it was getting really close. But with, I guess the interesting thing I was wanted to say was we you know we have quite a large assortment with with Ingram and. Um, products that we maybe ran out of that were normally top sellers uh, that we're doing it that we didn't have anymore. We started focusing our attention from a marketing and advertising standpoint to some of the products that maybe never really got the, the, um, the attention that they deserved. And we saw some really successful products, you know, during the time there. And now they're kind of becoming, you know, best sellers in their own right. So we're, we've, we've tried to, you know, just, diversify i guess again with with different uh, products that we wouldn't normally focus on but um, um yeah i mean it's tight don't get me wrong we we are we are our factories are up and running again which is great um but you know there is a big backlog so um we're, we're we're kind of taking it day by day but uh you know making progress as we go